for those in the future. Right. So, um, well, I'm just welcome everybody. Um, I'm just going to change the um, view. So, speaker view. Welcome everybody. My name is Christian McNeil, and um, I'm a three principles facilitator based in Scotland. And I am delighted tonight to welcome Kimberly Porter all the way from Florida. And Kimberly is the first speaker in a series of fortnightly calls I'm going to be doing on the topic of addiction. Um, and I'm inviting guests who have some kind of personal connection with the phenomenon, if that's the right word, of addiction, um, and just to, to share their experience and, and, and just to talk about how the three principles has been helpful to them. So the reason I, I, I was really delighted to start with Kimberly because Kimberly, you were one of the first people I heard speaking on the subject. Um, I think the very first Three Principles Conference in London, which was probably in 2010 or 2011. And um, at that point, I had been in recovery for over 20 years, but I'd spent a lot of it kind of struggling at times or trying very hard to do the right thing and um and it certainly wasn't all how does the phrase go happy joyous and free um you know there, there, there was a, a lot of things that seemed to be not going very well at times and, and I you know I, I I struggled with to, to find you know serenity was more of a theory than a that than a um a reality for me and I heard you speak at at this conference and I think it may have been a recording of the conference in fact but I, I when I heard you I thought that woman has a sort of quality that I couldn't define um, but it was something that I didn't have and I hadn't it witnessed much elsewhere and and it got me really intrigued it was one of the things that convinced me if I needed any convincing that there was something mm -hmm deep and important in the three principles for me and and I'd had that feeling since the first weekend that um with Jamie Smart and Aaron Turner a few months earlier or, um but it's and it has I, and I've never lost that um but I was really um you, you know you, I, I really enjoyed listening to you and we've got to know each other a little bit but via Facebook and online um since then although it's been it's taken a while for us to get around to doing this so I'm really delighted that you've um you know that you've agreed to do this I'm, I'm um it's a real privilege to to have you here and um I'm not going to try and sort of summarise your story or say anything about it. I'm going to leave that to you or to say whatever you would like to say. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Kimberly, and, and I'm just going to sit back and enjoy listening to whatever comes out from you today. Thank you. <clears throat> that was very moving, what you shared, and I just appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to talk today. I want to say thank you to you and welcome to all your guests, for those that are joining and those who might be listening later. Um, through the video. Um, this is my first um, public online guest speaking since 2014. Um, I was first, um, as you remember, I did do the conference in uh, London, and I think it was 2010 was my first time to the UK, and it was an amazing experience. Um, that was in the beginning of um, my exposure um, to the three principles. And so I met Chip and Jan Chipman at a women's facility in 2005. And that was my first time hearing about the principles. And I too had struggled with addiction from 1985 to 2002. So I had only been in recovery for a few years when I first heard this, but I had a lot of, um, mental anguish and turmoil because my thinking was very repetitive. Um, I had a lot of habitual thinking. I would, um, had a lot of guilt, a lot of remorse. Um, when I got exposed to the principles, it's just something woke up inside me. And I feel, feel like I had went to a deeper spiritual level, level within myself and that my whole journey in recovery became more spiritual by this understanding. Um, you know, to learn about mind being the energy behind us, and behind our thinking and behind creation, to learn about 
about consciousness and that we're not just talking about the ability to be aware, but to learn about the different levels of awareness. That was really huge and impact me. It, it, it impacted me in ways that I was able to understand how thought, the other principle, the third principle was really working and that a lot of the situations I found myself in, I kind of created via thought and they weren't necessarily reality, but after I spent so much time thinking about all these negative things and, you know, the years that I wasted, all the things that I had went through, just playing over and over in my head, when I went to that first class, it was like being set free from all of that mental torture that I had been putting myself through for all those years. And so I heard something and something woke up inside me. And in the first years of this, I was very vulnerable and um, kind of raw. <laughs> um, and I just would share without any filters, without any hesitance, you know? And I think that that's um, really the place that I needed to be and, and to learn to just be present with people and not be all in my head. That was really huge. And, and those conferences and those teachings and reading Sid's books and, you know, a lot of, a lot of the things that I was hearing from other people was just registering at it at a very profound, deep level and was quieting my habitual thinking down. And I realized the more that I became present with people, just being in the moment with them, the more free I felt, the more I felt better about my life. And those recordings I used to play in my head like over and over and over again, just started going away. They started fading. And I was really able to hear things, um, I think, for the first time in my life because I understood how thought was creating my perception of reality and um, just playing those same old things over and over again is why I kept being stuck in that place of regret, a place of um, embarrassment, of not feeling worthy. You know, all of those things were lies that I was telling myself through my thoughts, you know. And so when I first was exposed to this in 2005, it was like being set free for the first time in my life. Um, and, you know, words can't even do it justice um, to, to share with people how beautiful my life is now and, and how amazing things are. Um, I've, I got, I was able to go, um, register for school and college and I was a high school dropout. Um, uh, I just graduated with my bachelor's. I had a 3.8 GPA when I graduated with my bachelor's in 2017. Uh, I had this door open up for a job in corporate America where I've been working for a couple of years as an account manager at a major, um, POS global corporation. Um, I have a very healthy and whole relationship with my children, with my family. Um, it's just, it's amazing. And just being able to understand how all of that is possible after all that I've went through in my life is just, it's profound. I sit back sometimes and I think, I'm really here right now. Um, just being in the moment, like with my, with my children, with people at work, um, the stress level, <laughs> I, you know, has gone down completely. Um, I just feel happy in this moment. And so being able to share with other people is just, to me, is a really great gift. Um, I, I'm open for any questions that anybody might have right now um any particular areas that you you know want me to talk about uh, i do find that the deeper that i've gone in this understanding the less i have to talk about the negative part of, of before i was in recovery 
which before I used to share like my whole story. And a couple of years ago, I was, I was doing a speaking engagement for um, a detention center uh, with a friend of mine who used to be a chaplain at a women's facility. And I was talking to a bunch of girls who were in a detention center and they're like, you know, they're wanting all the glory details and the gory details, I'm sorry, of my experience when I was an addict. And I said, you know, there's, there's nothing good in really talking about that. That's what gets us stuck is when we go back and relive those memories. And what I discovered through the principles help me be present with people and I don't have to go there in my story just being able to share where I'm at right now and how this understandings help me you know be present I think that's the the most beautiful gift that we can give anyone is really helping them understand how to be present in this moment with the people that we're in we're engaging our conversation with that's the gift that we give each other you know, yeah. through our conversation. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you should say that, Kimberly, because right from the get-go when I got into recovery, I really wanted to hear about people living in recovery. I was not interested in the war stories. And, and, and I also, it's just a bit of a, a myth that, that, um, that, you, that, that, that you've got to go there. Because I, I thought, well, you know, I know how to do that bit. I couldn't stop doing that bit, I, you know, I, but I, I, I didn't know how to um, really thrive and blossom in life. And, and, it, and it was all, that was always what I was hungry for. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I totally get that. So, but 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 bearing in mind that that, that this is um, about addictions, and, and one of the things I really wanted to, to or hoped that that this would do is kind of give people a you know a sense of the movement that happens. And it sounds like, and I think I maybe didn't know this about your story. So it sounds like you, that you'd that you had discovered um, re- recovery, as it were, before you, you you stumbled across the principles. But the the principles took you to a deeper level. And is that something you could say more about? And, and I would also just reiterate: that if anybody else has other questions, please do come in, so so that I don't hog it all. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the story that the Chipmans shared with us first was their, their, their uh, journey of searching and always looking for something and before they met Sid Banks. And, um, and that just kind of struck me because even, you know, before the addiction, I felt at a very young age, I was always searching and looking for a place where I could fit in. I just didn't quite feel like I fit in anywhere or that people understood um, some of the things that I had suffered through or I went through growing up and those types of things. And, you know, just playing those things over and over. And, and then I realized, no wonder I never could stay clean for very long because somehow I was always going back to those conversations or going back to reliving those things in my head but when they shared about you know being on this journey and they were always searching and then you know they met Sid and he he talked about these three principles and one of the things that they said that really impact me is like all we have right now in life is this moment and they were so present like that touched me in a different way being able to just be there and be with people in that moment and not, you know, think about the future or thinking about the past or, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay these bills? Blah, 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 you know, all the stuff that we go through, which is sometimes normal thinking for some people, but I think I had kept it. I had carried it to like a different level. Like I was, I called myself a habitual thinker. Like I constantly thought about these things and relived them. And I realized that I never was really truly present with people. And that was something that I thought was so different about what they shared. And when I began to experience it myself, I felt so free. And suddenly, recovery was a whole different thing to me. It's like not just a recovery from a chemical or an alcohol addiction. 
Um, but recovery from my own thinking, like that's where I felt like I was because that's what took me to those places and convinced me to use or drink beyond, you know, um, a reasonable state of mind, um, over and over again. I always thought that was the best way to escape. And basically I think that's what I was trying to do was escape my own thinking. And when they shared that, um, in that first class, and I just noticed something different about them, their whole presence was just, I don't know. I just felt so much love, just like oozing out of them mm. and, and non-judgment. That was the other thing I hadn't really experienced really being with present, really being present with people. You don't have room to judge them or to pass any kind of expectations on them. And I felt that was different um, than a lot of the recovery programs and I'm not knocking any of them. You know, everybody has uh, different ways and different approaches to recovery. But for, for me, it was always, there was a lot of expectations placed on you and there was a lot of, um, you know, um, different requirements to get it, you know, to make it through recovery, you know, uh, the 12 steps and all these other things. But with this, it was just simply learning the spiritual gifts that you were born and created with and how you're using them that really touched me. And then I looked at these people that were teaching this understanding and I was like, my goodness, they're, they're so loving and kind and, and so present. Like, I really want to be present with people. I think if I could be present with people in this moment, like, like that you know, could really help me get to the next level and really understand like how my thinking's working. And it, and it just came, you know, it wasn't have, like I had to do anything. I just had to be quiet and listen. And that was probably the hardest thing for me was to be quiet and listen. <laughs> <laughs> but they made it very easy to just listen, you know, and, um, yeah, so that that was that was a very profound moment in my life, and I think that's where everything changed for me. Now, I'm not going to say that after I learned the principles that life was just you know peaches and cream, and you know you know all this money pouring in or all this wealth, or <laughs> but I will say that there is all this happiness and joy being present with people, being free from all that thinking, like that's the most beautiful gift and uh, being able to share and talk to people like yourself and Richard and everyone else on this uh, call, like it's just such a, a beautiful gift to be able to just share um, at, any, at any level with people and help, help people not suffer um, because that's, that's basically what happens is people are really suffering in their thinking and that's what leads them to do drugs or alcohol. It's what leads people to commit suicide or crimes. It basically starts in their head and their thinking. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, and I guess you're touching on what, what was for me a really massive insight right at the beginning and and, and I had kind of been I'd, I'd kind of been coming it to it myself where I was I was sort of questioning the whole idea that um there was sort of something wrong with me that needed fixed you know that um, a, a, a sickness if you like and and I'm not again you know I think the disease model of addiction it you know it was a step forward from you know people being either morally wanting or you know in, insane <laughs> So it was, a, you know, it was a step in the right direction, but it, it, it I, I had really begun to sort of question that, that, you know, that I had the idea that I had this, um, this thing wrong with me that I needed to, um, work on and work on. And, um, I, um, and I went the first through three principles thing I went to the, 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 I don't even know who said or whether it was said in terms, but there was this idea that you're not broken. No one's broken. Yeah. 
And it was so, uh, yes, that's it. You know, someone who's kind of expressed, and, and the, it wasn't because somebody said it, that, but it, it was sort of somebody said what I hadn't quite been able to put together. And, mm. um, and, and I could see the, the truth of that. And it was so helpful that, you know, there, there's nowhere to get to, um, you know, that ev everything is already available. All the resources I need are already available to me. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and it was, it was huge actually. It was like, you know, it was like a big weight being lifted. I was no longer working hard to sort of fix myself so much as, uh, you know, able to allow this to unfold, to explore, to, to you know, to see what, you know, just to follow my nose or whatever. Um, and yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you say that because I was speaking at a, um, a, a youth facility for young men um, with uh, over in St. Pete and it's called the Brit House and it's a juvenile offenders mm -hmm. who have been confined to this program and if they make it through the program they um, and you know do everything they're supposed to um, they'll the withhold judification so there's not any legal charges against them and so I go there we call it third chicken Sunday because this is one of the churches I'm involved in goes over every third Sunday and takes um, chicken from this famous fried chicken place over here in St. Pete but I was sharing with them that exact um, thing that you're not broken that everything you have inside you is whole and complete it's just where we break where we're what, what happens is we get a breakdown in our thinking mm. but we ourselves are not broken and the look on some of those young men's faces and there there was a there was a I call him a child because he was one of the youngest ones was 12 and the oldest are like 18 because after 18 they can't be there but the youngest little boy was like 12 years old and um, it was so amazing to see the look in his face because nobody had ever told him that he was not broken and, and, and no, he had never heard that he's good just the way he is and that he's perfect just the way he is. And, and I think that that's what I heard as well. You know, when, when the Chipmans would come and talk to us and share that, that we we weren't broken. And, you know, when you hear that your whole life, and then you think that there's something wrong with you or you have this disease that's uncurable and you're going to be this way the rest of your life or you're damaged goods or you'll never amount to nothing. When, when we hear that so often, either from our own thinking or other people, we begin to believe it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's amazing that you said that because that is exactly what happened. I, I just heard something and I realized that I'm good just the way that I am you know I'm living my best life now because of this profound understanding and I would have never thought it was possible that in this moment we can live our best life in this very moment hmm. you know I'm just remembering in early in my recovery, I was just about a year in. I went on this retreat, and it was and and I and when I went, I was, I mean, I was tearing my hair out um, because I was in. Um, I got myself into a sort of situation where I, you, you know, with I, I, to do, I was moving house, and it was you know it was all about to go really pear shaped and have terrible financial consequences for me. And I was, you know, I was I just I was really obsessing about it, worrying about it, you know, and so on. And I went, and I think the last thing I need is this retreat. But I went to it anyway because I was booked. And I remember <laughs> the I, 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 I remember the priest. That, it was run by a priest, but he was in recovery. It wasn't like a, a religious thing. And him, I remember him saying, just that very thing. He said, you know, God needs you, and God wants you, and God loves you as you are in this moment. And it just kind of hit me, uh, you know, then. And I didn't really even even the word God. You know, it wasn't. I didn't really have a God in that sense, but it didn't matter because it was, there was something, there was a truth to it and a, a profundity to it. And, um, and it was a wonderful moment. And, you know, lots of other nice things happened on that retreat. And, and by the time I left, nothing had changed on the outside, not a thing. Um, but I was in a place of peace. 
I was in a place of complete peace. And it was an interesting example of what we talk about in, in the principles, how, you know, our feelings are not coming from our circumstances. They are 100% an inside job. I had innocently and unwittingly created all that stress and distress and worry for myself. And, and here was the evidence of it could shift as the inside shifted, um, you know, the, the experience of it shifted. But it's funny because I didn't, that isn't what I, you know, I fell back into that sort of worrying and trying to fix myself and, and acting as though I wasn't enough right here, right now, you know, that, uh, um, and, and, you know, and, I, and today, um, it, it just, it is what it is and it was what it was, but, and, you know, there's no point in regretting it, but that, but that's, um, the, I'm glad I'm no longer doing that. And I, I, I can fall asleep to all this at any point, but I'm glad that I'm, um, you know, I've, I've got to say, uh, you, you know, that at a deep level, even though I can forget it at times, at a deep level, I have that knowing that I'm not broken, that I am enough. And, um, and that if I'm, if I'm unhappy, it's not because of my circumstance. It really is just the, the way thought is coming through me about those circumstances in that moment, you know, and that's hopeful to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, I, I taught this for nine years when, you know, I was right after I met the Chipmans, I think I was involved for about nine years teaching the principles through a nonprofit. And then one day I didn't have a job there anymore. And my whole world just kind of flipped upside down. And for that one moment um, that I kept carrying for one moment to a month to three months, like I, I, my whole world was upside down. And, and it seemed like I had forgotten everything that I knew for nine months or nine years, everything that I had taught other people, all the things that I heard and I was, all the things that impact my life to take me through those nine years to get where I was, it felt like for one moment, the rug was ripped out from under me. And, and, and for a little while I was very upset. And then in 2017, I had this revelation, you know, I was like, what are you doing? You're, you're keeping all of this alive in your thinking. You have to let it go and remember what you learned and what you have inside of you is not broken. And a peace came over me. And I feel like everything that I went through for those two years, you know, I, had, I was out of a job. I couldn't find another job. I lost everything. And I was really became a person that I didn't want to be for those two years, very upset and depressed and not the same person I was for nine years. And I was thinking, wait a minute, I'm exactly the same person. It's my thinking that's reverted back. And I opened, I just opened up one of Sid's books. Um, uh, oh goodness. My mind just, I can't remember exactly. Um, the missing link. That's the name of it. I just opened it up. Right. And there was exactly confirmation from Sid Banks in this book that telling me that, that there was a part about, it was talking about thought. And being stuck in thoughts, like um, playing the same thoughts over and over and expecting to see a different reality. And, and I was creating this reality that's not even real. Like I, I had all these things going on in my head. That was the end of my future. That was the end of my work. That, you know, all these things going and I couldn't see that really it was a moment for me to grow even deeper in the principles. And that's what happened. I had a revelation that day. I was able to release all of that. And then, the, and I had been looking for jobs. Let me tell you, I had filled out probably 150 applications between that year and a half. And I was still going to college. And one day I filled out this application and I got this amazing offer. I went through all the interviews and, and I feel like it's because I remembered what I knew all along that I wasn't broken. And then I was able to reach a deeper understanding even inside myself 
than I had done those nine years. Um, when I went to the interview for the first time in a year and a half, I really felt like I was completely present with that person. And I think that was the difference in getting that job, the job I still have now, and, and, and being present with them really impact the person that was interviewing. In fact, she was my boss, ended up being my boss for like seven months. And then we went through some changes in this, in this uh, corporation that I'm currently working at. But that has really helped me in my position as an account manager at this global corporation I'm working for right now. It's really being present with people, being present with my customers. And we've had four transitions where we've laid off hundreds of people and I'm one of the remaining people still working. And I think it's because I understand and remember how important it is to be present with people. Like that's the most precious gift that I can give anyone that I'm talking with is really being present. And in order to do that, I can't be all caught up in my thinking about the past or how I was hurt or who I hurt or using or, you know, being an, an alcoholic in recovery. Like all of that is meaningless in this very moment. Mm. What matters is being here right here with you and the people on the call or my daughter, or whoever I'm in the room with, mm. or my boss, or my customers, like, that's the best gift that you can give anyone, it's just being there with them. And, yeah. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like when you're right there, you can't have any bitterness or, or anger. You have nothing but like love and, and happiness in this moment, because you're present. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so does any does anybody have me um, on the call have any questions or comments? Um, I know Richard has had to s sort of switch off. He's um, okay. yeah ha helping his d daughter. So I know I don't think there are any other um, okay. questions from anybody else at the moment. Um, How about you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, no, I was going to just say, um, could, could you say a little more about how, how your, your understanding has um, impacted your relationship with your children? Because I know you're, you're a mother of four, and um, um, I'm also a mom. You know, so it's five, of course. Oh, I thought you had four. Oh, I'm completely wrong about that. Wow. I, I do have... I have four children that lived at home up until recently, but uh -huh. my daughter is a school teacher. And so she lives in, she lives in Lakeland. Um, and this is, this is amazing because all of my kids just about, uh, are in public service. Huh. So my daughter is a teacher. Mm -hmm. My, my, one of my sons, that's a twin is a deputy sheriff. He just became a sheriff last year. So he works at the jail. Uh, the first two years they have to work in the jail. My, um, my, he's a twin. So my other son works, uh, in a call center. He's a supervisor in a call center. And so he does Facebook mediation, um, video moderator. So he monitors videos before they go live on Facebook, which is mm -hmm. really important. My youngest son is a fireman, just became a fireman and he works in the Gainesville fire, uh, rescue. And then my youngest daughter is 16. And so my, my children um, have all at one time or another, and either through uh, um, youth ministry or at church or in their professions, have shared um, my story and how I was an inspiration to them to go into the fields where they're at because um, just how much I've accomplished and turned my life around. Um, I'm coming up on 17 years of sobriety. So um, that's, you know, amazing. Um, uh, I think amazing for me and for my kids. But a lot of times I would take them with me to teach when I worked, uh, when I worked for the nonprofit um, and worked with Chip and Jan and I would guest speak. They were a lot younger 
And so I would take them with me sometimes to teach classes and they got involved with helping others and going to um, recovery centers, um, you know, going into the jail and the prison, they didn't necessarily go, but they knew and they saw videos where I would go in and talk to men and women who were incarcerated or in drug programs or uh, outreach facilities. Um, and so just, you know, seeing the change in me from when they were little to over the last uh, 14 years since I've been exposed really impact each one of them in a different way and has you know led them to go into the fields uh, the career fields that they've chosen um, I think they at first they were skeptical because they've seen me in recovery before mm -hmm. but then there was something different when I came home and, and, and we were all reunited as a family uh, in, in 2006, and my children felt that. They felt that I was really present with them. Um, I had a, a hope and a, and a spiritual essence. My one son has told me that I had a spiritual essence about me that was different, and it really made him feel safe, like he just knew this was it. This was the last time that my mom was not going to be using anymore. And I think them sharing and being open like that, um, you know, also helped me um, being, my one son's read all of Sid's books. Um, my son, Zach, that's the sheriff. And, and I think that he, you know, has really touched me in a lot of different ways by being able to articulate how much coming home and being different and, and seeing that really made him feel safe, like I wasn't going to leave again. Um, you know, being able to be honest and vulnerable in front of my children, yeah. um, making yeah. that amends, and, and, and then putting words, not words out, but action behind my words. Mm. I didn't come and make promises like before. You know, I didn't have to say anything. I just did it. I just lived it. And I think yeah. just living it instead of going off with all these promises and these grand conversations, I just came home and I lived what I learned and I lived what I knew and, and I just did it. Hmm. And I think that made a difference. I'm sure. So, yeah, I, I, I really liked what you were saying about the, 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 the just doing it, just, just showing up in life, just being different as opposed to talking yeah. about it or um, making promises and so on. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Richard was just, we were just talking about um, my children and how, like, like, we didn't go teach them, mm. the, the principles. Yeah. They, they were did, did you ever try that? Did you ever try to teach them, force it on them? <laughs> that would just be me no. then. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, when I was first re reunited with them in 06, they, I couldn't tell them anything. And I really just had to live in the moment and, and do. Uh, just be present and, and just live what I, had, what I knew and live what I know. And so I would take, I would take them with me sometimes on speaking engagements and public um, community programs and stuff that we did uh, between St. Pete and, and Hillsborough County area. And, and each one of them, um, and I was just sharing this with Richard, for, for most children who grow up with parents, and it was both parents, there was domestic violence um, and substance abuse in our home most kids do not come out of that um, very healthy. Most kids, you know, the percentages all over the world are very high that when kids are raised in that environment, they're either going to be criminals or drug addicts or, you know, fo you know, follow in, in, in your footsteps with alcohol and substance abuse and stuff like that. And I have to say that I really believe that that early exposure that my children had with Chip and Jan and with, with um, Sid Banks coming here and, and, and Julie, his wife, and, and then watching me go out in the community. Um, sometimes they would come with me. And while I was doing speaking engagements, they've seen my videos. 
being flown to the UK and Salt Springs to, to share my story, that impact them in ways that I didn't even think about until you and Richard were just talking to me. And my, my children have all come out very healthy. They've graduated with honors and, you know, high school and college. They've gone to do public service. I mean, they're all still very young. They're in their 20s, early 20s. My oldest daughter's 29. My twins are 25. My youngest son is 23. And then my 16-year-old. Um, and I'm so blessed that my children are able to be present and live in the moment that they, they don't have anger and bitterness towards me or even towards society about what they went through when they were younger. I really believe it's because they saw this difference. They saw this change in me. They saw me work hard to get my degree. Um, they saw me go out and impact and touch people's lives with the three principles that all of that worked to, to form their character, their forgiveness towards me. And again, I didn't have to say anything. I just lived it. And I think that was the difference. I, I really do. I wondered if you've experienced what I noticed after that very first weekend and um, I don't know if I can fully kind of articulate this, but I, I had a real sense of not only is this true for me that, you know, that I am whole and complete and have what I need, but it's also true for my children. And mm -hmm. in that realization, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of articulating it more in a more sort of fluid way than I, maybe it happened in, because that was sort of instant. Because what I noticed then was, a weight went off and I realized that I'd be, I'd felt so responsible for my children. Um, and I mean, I was, I, I wasn't with their father. We'd split up when they were small and I felt, you know, tremendous responsibility for that. And, and what have I done to them? And, and, you know, and how can I make that up? And it was like, all of that was just sort of, um, removed and, and, and I don't mean that I cease to care about them or, or be involved in their lives or anything like that, but I, it was something very helpful. I think, for me definitely but also for them for for me to acknowledge that, that this wholeness that that was in was in them um that it, that they are all of, and um yeah it was it was lovely you know so it, I, I it just took off a layer of 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 worry and and concern um and, and again at times I can, I can get very caught up in it with, with, with things that are going on with one or other mine are 23 and 24 23 and 25 now um uh, but it's yeah it's um it's it's a lovely thing and i mean i felt very close to my children beforehand but it's but it's there is now nothing i enjoy more than hang kind of hanging out with my children you know and just yesterday my daughter had her birthday this week and we spent the day on a scottish island oh and, and it was actually thanks to richard's wife that we found out about this <laughs> cycling around tyree you know that was her that, and it was just you know just great just lovely wow yeah. 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 That's, um, I think the greatest gift out of all of this is, is the relationship that I have now with my kids. And I, I, I know a lot of men and women coming out of recovery and their kids are, you know, angry and bitter and resentful and, um, and it shows in their actions and reactions and, you know, so one of the things I, I tried to help them, it was kind of made a really big difference. One of the profound things that I heard in this understanding is that thought creates feelings and emotions. And so if you want to know why you're feeling what you're feeling, take a step back and look at what you're thinking. Kind of, and I'm not talking positive affirmation versus negative, you know, no, I'm just talking about the ability to think that aware, the, the level of awareness of what you're thinking and how that is impacting, impacting your feelings and emotion. And, and that kept me isolated from my kids a lot. And I saw in the past when I was going through other pro recovery programs before this exposure to the principles. And I was like, 
I wondered why I could never get past this, like, you know, three or four year mark. And then I would like, you know, be drinking again or whatever. And it just it dawned on me that I continuously was thinking of how guilty I felt about either having to leave them to go into a program or them having to live in domestic violence and see that um, the only way I thought I could escape was by drinking or, you know, using. And so I had a lot of guilt, a lot of thinking with that. And I realized that was like, I was imprisoning myself in my thoughts. And then when I learned about the principles, it was like, all of that just kind of like, poof. Like, I was like, wow, um, a light bulb went off. Um, when, when I realized how thought created feeling, that was huge. I was like, Ooh. oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm creating a lot of these emotions myself. <laughs> yeah. So the more I can be present with someone without all of that, just being in the moment, I'm fine right here. I'm perfect, whole, complete. I'm living my best life right here in this moment with my kids. And, you know, I'm not saying we don't have ups and downs and that sometimes we don't, you know, take a step back and maybe get caught up because, you know, each one of my kids process what happened differently. And um, I had one son that it took a little longer to get where he's at than um, the other ones as far as forgiving, forgiveness and living in the moment. but. I can honestly say that that one son is the one that really sharpened me, <laughs> so to speak, iron sharpens iron, and really helped me understand how much I know and how much I don't know <laughs> about the principles and about life. And so he would be the one that would challenge me. And we're like this now, like we're, we have a relationship that is so amazing. And I see little by little, he's letting that anger go little by little. I can see him living more in the moment. And in order to help facilitate that, I have to do, do it myself. And I can't allow myself to go back and relive those horrible things and feelings and, you know, things that happened to me. Um, just being forgiving and moving on. That's the best gift you can give yourself and the best gift you can give someone else. Hmm. Yeah, I guess with things like guilt and regret and shame in particular, it can be, it can seem very seductive to think that these are coming from what happened. These feelings are, are directly caused by what happened in the past and it can't be changed. And, 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 yeah. and 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 yet that's not not true because even before the principles we did not feel them every minute of every day you know they came and went yeah. and and we now know that they came and went uh, as our thinking got you know got caught up in a whole story about how wrong we were or how wrong we did or whatever yeah. um and yeah it's it, and it's just um and i think that was one of the things that struck me about you um, when I first heard you speak, Kimberly, that there was, that that you, I could hear you speaking about, and, and and you know maybe at that time you did speak more about the the you know the the, the ins and outs of what had happened, which was you, you know really fine at that time, but I could hear you speak, and it wasn't you weren't minimizing it, you weren't in denial, you weren't aggrandizing it, but there was just a, there was just a very factual uh, and nor was it nor was it dripping with sort of shame or or, or embarrassment or um you know that you weren't beating yourself up about it either and, and that was very powerful you know there was just there was no you weren't apologizing for, for for who you were and nor were you using it to you know as you know look how exciting my you know or how bad i was none of that it was just very factual and um very neutral and um and there was some that that quality that presence you've described um was palpable yeah it was good yeah yeah, mm. yeah. i'm i'm just thinking about uh a dinner that i had um 
with Sid Banks. And, and uh, one time when he came to town, he was staying here in Tampa. And um, I think my daughter was about four. She's 16 now. Um, my sons were probably 10 and seven and 10. Um, my oldest daughter was living with my mom at the time. And so, uh, Chip and Jan, Sid and Julie came, Judy came down, uh, and, um, invited us for dinner. And we went to Sonny's Barbecue, which is, I think, one of Sid's favorite places here in the States. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just remember it was the first time like we had really went because we didn't go out a lot as like um, a family. We mostly like would order takeout or KFC and eat it at home because, you know, um, so our kids to go out with and also with another couple like that was not something we normally did. But he made it feel so like we were so much like family, like just sat down and put you know, his arm around you and have a conversation, like just like you were the only person in the room, like you were the most important person in the world. And it was just so normal. And you could tell it was just, it wasn't fake or he wasn't putting on airs or, you know, it, I don't know. It just made a difference. And, and I just remember going to dinner that time and all of my kids were, they experienced the same thing. Like he, like Chip and Jan and, and Sid just, just made them feel like they were the most important person. <laughs> and they still talk about that dinner. And we have pictures of it. That when we went out to dinner with Sid Banks, like, you know, at the time they didn't know that, you know, like how well known he is. And now they're like older and like, oh, they realize, oh, he was this famous person who, took us out to dinner and just hugged us and shared with us and talked to us just like normal. And so we still kind of like reminisce about that and how much he made us feel welcome. I don't, I don't know. It just, he, they had just this way of making you feel like you're okay and you're safe. And, and that was a very important time for my kids because I had, I think I'd barely been here a year and barely been home a year at the time. So there were still, you know, emotions going up and down. Um, as you can see, I still cry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, it's a, it's a, a cry of gratitude and love for all that I have and all that I've been given through this understanding, the chances and the opportunities that people have take, you know, given to me. Um, it means a lot and I don't take it for granted. So anytime I can share, I'm happy to do it. Um, I just try to be as vulnerable in my sharing as I can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, lovely. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I really appreciate that. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm kind of thinking that maybe this is a, be a nice place just to leave it, Kimberly. And, Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and th thanks to everyone else who joined the call and Richard, you in particular. Thank um, you, Richard. It's nice meeting you. Yeah. So I'm just going to pause the recording there. <laughs>